Alhamdulillah wa kafa Wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazhin astafa Khususan ala afdalihim Wa khatamin nabiyin Muhammadin al-amin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba' Fa'awudhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتاب تبيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم respected imam brothers and sisters here at Malaba Masjid Hidayatul Islam in Silayan I hope I got that correct. In Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Ummah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. The world of Islam. And indeed, the world at large is at this moment poised on the brink of a pit of fire. The world is about to change as it has never changed before in history. A more evil world is coming. A world with greater oppression is coming. A world with more intense war on Islam, more sophisticated war on Islam is coming. And all of this on Israel's behalf. So that the Zionists can cause the state of Israel to replace the United States of America as a new ruling state in the world so that in the same way that Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica so too will a Pax Judaica replace Pax Americana why is this happening? 11 years ago I wrote the book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran which explained that subject. If the scholars of Islam do not at this critical moment in time explain the reality of the world in which we now live explain the world that is coming and prepare not only Muslims but also mankind who is willing to listen to us prepare them how to respond if we fail if Islamic scholarship fails, if the scholars of Islam fail, then do remember what Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said about akhiru zaman, the end time. Non-Muslims would be astonished to hear what he said. Hadith in the Sunan of Bayhaqi. He said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, 
It will not be long before that time will come. La yabqa min al Islam illa sma when nothing will remain of Islam but the name. Wa la yabqa min al Quran illa rasma when nothing will remain of the Quran but the traces of the writing. Masajiduhum amiratun. وَهِيَ خَرَابُ مِنَ الْهُدَى The masajid will be grand structures, thousands of people in the masjid. But they will be devoid of guidance. And now listen to the last piece. وَلَمَاءُهُمْ The ulama of those people. At that time, Sharrun nasi mimman tahta adim is sama. They would be the worst people beneath the sky. Mini indi him tahrujul fitna, wafi him tao. They would be the centers of fitna which tests and corrupts the people. And so, it is necessary for Islamic scholarship at this critical moment to address the reality that confronts us in the world today and to use the Qur'an to do that. Since Allah says in the Qur'an, in Surah An-Nahl, that He sent down this book to perform this function to explain all things and it is further necessary for Islamic scholarship to turn to the seerah and the sunnah of Nabi Muhammad so that we can apply it to this age for Allah says about the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alayhi Wa Sallam Laqad kana lakum Fi Rasulillahi Uswatun Hasana Ila Akhiril Aya That he is the perfect model Universally applicable Eternally applicable Cosmetic Islam cannot do that job. No. Cosmetic Islam is that one in which you go to the masjid and you go back home. And you go to the masjid and you go back home. And you go to the masjid and you go back home. And the same bayan is being repeated over and over and over again for 60, 70 years like clockwork. Cosmetic Islam puts his head in the sand like an ostrich and does not attempt to either study or respond the world to the world in which we live. And so that cannot succeed in doing the job that we must do. And then there is that Protestant version of Islam in which there is no critical thinking. No critical thought. How to apply the truth in this age. How to use the Quran to explain the reality of the world today. No. For Protestant Islam, only Allah and His Messenger and the Aslaf, the early Muslims, can explain and interpret. No Imran Hussein cannot do that. And we will not allow him to do that. But guess what? The world is listening to Imran Hussein. And we say thank Allah for that. 
Today we address the Sunnah and we advise and we remind yes the bed is a Sunnah and it is an important Sunnah Allah did not put the beard on the face of the male by accident He put the beard on the face of the male with wisdom So that from a distance we can distinguish who is male and who is female Without having to look at any other part of the body That's wisdom And of course he put the blade he put the beard on the face of the male so that babies can play with the beard so if you shave your beard you're being unjust to your babies <laughs> they can't play with the beard anymore the sunnah is the clothing that we wear that is designed to conform to a certain norm of modesty but this is not the only sunnah the sunnah is how we eat but this is not the only sunnah the sunnah also incle includes being aware of the world in which you live or to be more precise for today's lecture to be aware of your strategic environment and you are engaged in the struggle of truth against falsehood and the forces of falsehood are always going to attack you but in the end truth must vanquish falsehood and so the strategic environment in terms of the rivalry between truth and falsehood how to respond to that strategic environment is also the sunnah and so today we address a subject you never heard of before because nobody teaches the subject we address the strategic sunnah and having explained and described the strategic sunnah we then apply it to this critical moment in which we now live and this requires critical thought this also requires some intuitive thought and so now with Allah's blessed name let us seek to recall this strategic sunnah in the struggle between truth and falsehood between justice and injustice Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was attacked war on Islam was waged by the Quraysh by the forces of oppression and injustice and falsehood and idolatry and when you are faced with war on Islam what do you do? if you are not strong enough do you compromise in order to continue to live where you are in order to hold on to your green card and to hold on to your job and to hold on to your car and your house or do you hold on to the truth regardless of consequences the sunnah is that even if you have to give up Makkah you hold on to the truth and you keep on proclaiming the truth when that happens you will have to make hijra as so many are now making hijra from Britain 
and from the United States of America and from Australia and let us also include Singapore because you no longer have the freedom to preach the truth but when he made Hijra that was not the end they did not leave him alone no they came after us and then there was the battle of Badr and in that battle we gave them a beating it was humiliating for them as it is today humiliating to them that our guerrilla warfare in Afghanistan has succeeded against the mightiest force in the world it's humiliating to them that for 10 years they have given all that they could give to Afghanistan and yet they have not succeeded so we were successful at Badr but they were so humiliated that they wanted revenge and then they came back at us now with the biggest army that they could raise the Quraysh they didn't seek help from others not yet this is the Quraysh against you and so they came and we fought at Uhad and it was a stalemate they could not move in for the kill because we retreated up the mountain and so yes they had the upper hand over us at Uhad but they could not destroy us it was a stalemate so they said that we have avenged for Badr we have beaten you at Uhad but the war still continues and then they came two years later with the largest military alliance they could possibly bring together and this time they came for the kill to finish off us completely once and for all but no they did not succeed and they had to fold their tents and go back home when the siege did not succeed and so now you have military stalemate what's going to happen while they were at Khandaq besieging us we had an alliance with the pagan Arabs and with the Jews called the Mithaq of Medina and that Mithaq of Medina was a treaty with certain obligations treaty obligations that members of the treaty could not support an enemy against a fellow member of the treaty and the Jews violated that <coughs> and so as soon as the Khandaq war had failed and the Quraysh and the, the alliance had withdrawn we took action against Banu Khurayza before that Banu Kainuka and the Jews fled to Khayba they lost their properties in Medina and they were grinding their teeth in anger and in frustration they wanted blood they wanted vengeance and they built their base in Khaybah the Quraysh on the other hand to the south I wish we had a map were also very frustrated because they had given to warfare all that they could and they had not succeeded if we were to sit in Medina and do nothing as if today we were to sit in the world 
and do nothing what would be the consequence answer Khayba and Makkah will make an alliance against us Khayba is to the northwest Makkah is to the south and we would be sandwiched Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam understood this strategic environment in which the Muslims were located understood that you could not sit down and do nothing go to the masjid and go back home go to the masjid and go back home that you needed an initiative that would alter this strategic environment and make it more advantageous for you <coughs> what did he do in fact it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent the guidance which is applicable to us today as Israel prepares to launch its attack on Iran and on Pakistan and then on Egypt Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam had a dream or a vision more properly in which he saw himself making tawaf around the Kaaba but the Kaaba is in Makkah and we and Makkah are at war with each other, with each other. how can you go to the Kaaba but this was a peace offensive that was dazzling in its diplomatic brilliance he woke up from his sleep and this is now the year six of the hijra and he announced that he is going to make umrah to visit the house of allah the whole of arabia recognized the right of every Arab to visit the house of Allah and if the Quraysh were to block you from visiting the house of Allah you will win public opinion on your side and they will be cornered But if the Quraysh allows us to perform the Umrah while we are at war, they are at war with us and we go to Makkah and we make the Umrah and we make the Tawaf and we come back home the whole of Arabia would be laughing at the Quraysh and so when Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam announced that we're going to the house of Allah to make the pilgrimage, the lesser pilgrimage, the Umrah. This was a peace offensive which placed the Quraysh on the horns of a dilemma on the horns of a dilemma they could not allow us to come because that would be embarrassing and they could not prevent us from coming because that would be a public relations disaster for them it's called the horns of a dilemma and it is diplomacy at its most brilliant a peace offensive against someone waging war against you there was a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that vision which directed our attention first towards Makkah rather than to Khaybah if we had not announced that we're going to Mecca on a pilgrimage 
to the house of Allah. If we had taken up arms to go and fight Makkah, then what would the Khayba do? When we have left Medina to march down to Makkah, Khayba will attack Medina and take Medina. And we lose our base. So we can't move south. No, we lose Medina. And if we were to leave Medina to go and attack Khayba, what's going to happen? Makkah will come and take Medina because Medina would not be defended. So we cannot go south to attack Makkah, nor can we go northwest to attack Khayba. Because either of these two will lose Medina. We cannot sit doing nothing because if we sit, Khaybar and Makkah will form an alliance against us. But if we leave Medina to go to the house of Allah on a pilgrimage, then if Khaybar were to attack Medina, the whole Arab world will rise up against Khaybar. How can you do that? to a people who have gone to visit the house of Allah. Have you no shame? We will teach you a lesson you will never forget. The whole of Arabia would have fought on our behalf to defend Medina. This is the brilliance of this initiative, this peace offensive. That we could travel down to Mecca without any fear of Medina being attacked by Khayba behind our backs. Mecca decided to send 200 men with horses to prevent us from reaching Mecca. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam was alerted. So he had intelligence, military intelligence, and he took a circuitous route and was successful in bypassing the 200 horsemen led by Khalid bin Walid. And having successfully bypassed them, we were able to reach into the area that is known as the Haram, the sacred area where you cannot be attacked. As soon as we entered that area, we camped at a place called Hodaibia. It was not our intention to march straight to Mecca. We camped at Hudaybiyah so that Makkah will now have to decide the ball is in your court now. What is Makkah going to do? Remember, they can't allow us in. The whole of Arabia would laugh at them and they cannot prevent us from entering because then all of Arabia will turn against them. You are violating the customary law. In other words, what we did, Masha Allah, we forced the enemy to the negotiating table. We forced them to come and talk to us. They sent one of their elders to come and talk to us. And he returned with the warning to them, leave this man alone. I have been to the courts of kings and emperors, I've never seen anyone so honored and so protected by his people as Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And this man has come in peace. They don't have any weapons with them other than the sword 
which every Arab is allowed according to customary law. Leave him alone. They sent to someone else after that. And when the Prophet saw him coming, he knew that this was a man with a very deep sense of the spiritual and of the sacred, although he's mushrik. So the Prophet ﷺ engages now in the psychology of warfare. Because he knows the personality of that man, he ordered that the animals of sacrifice, the animals of Qurban, and in those days the animals were very gaily, beautifully decorated with garlands around their necks. So from the time you see such an animal, you would know, you would recognize this is an animal of Qurban. So he ordered that these animals, these camels, be paraded in front of this man while he's coming. So he would see them from a distance. Why? From the man, from the time the man saw the animals of Qurban, which every Arab can recognize. He was so moved psychologically, spiritually, that he turned back and went back. That's all he needed to see. That's all to show respect for the Muslims who had come to the house of Allah. And so the Quraysh realized that they had no alternative but to negotiate. So they sent Suhail bin Amr who was a, a diplomat. <laughs> Suhail conceded even before he arrived, conceded that we can't stop you. <laughs> we can't stop you from visiting the house of Allah. But Suhail arrived with this mission to try to get something with which the Quraysh can save face from embarrassment. And so the ne nego negotiations quickly got on the way to try to find a face-saving device for the Quraysh. Number one, the Quraysh offered us Ten years of a truce, no fighting. Ten years. That does not make ten years the sunnah. If they had offered five, we would have accepted five. If they had offered fifteen, we would have accepted the fifteen. Because we wanted the truce. I'll tell you why. This truce that the Quraysh offered to us was a strategic breakthrough for us of tremendous importance. And so we were very happy when Suhail offered 10 years of no fighting. We couldn't conceal our happiness. But if there is a truce, no fighting, the implication is that the Quraysh is not at war with us. So if the Muslims come into Mecca, Mecca is not humiliated. There's no embarrassment because we have a truce. So that was very intelligent of the Quraysh to offer the truce. But that's what we wanted. In addition to that, they wanted to, they wanted to mix, get some blood. So they said, this year, you will not perform the Umrah. And we agreed. We agreed. There is a difference between the rice grain and the husk around the grain. And we were not concerned about fighting over the husk. We were concerned about the grain. 
And so we have a diplomatic sunnah here that when you are negotiating you must pour, you must concentrate on the grain and not on the husk. Huh? So we said okay. He said you'll have to make your qurban here in Hudaybiyah. Oh my gosh. The Arabs have never ever seen this before. Qurban is there in Mecca. How can we do it here? No Muslim was prepared <laughs> to do it. And then one of the wives of the Prophet والسلام, said to him, you do it and then they will do it. And see, he took the knife in his blessed hand and he sacrificed his animal. And then the other Muslims did it. But they wanted to put some more salt in the wound. It's not just the humiliation that this year you cannot make Umrah. This year you cannot come to the Kaaba. Next year you can come. But you can only come for three days. In and out. And during those three days we are going to vacate the city. <laughs> They didn't tell us that because they didn't want to have any contact with us. But more than that, listen carefully now. If anyone from Mecca were to leave Mecca, accept Islam and make Hijrah to join you, in Medina, you will send him back. But if anyone from Medina were to leave you to come back to Mecca, we don't have to send him back. That did not go down well at all with the Muslims. That seemed to be one-sided. That seemed to be advantageous to the Quraysh. Why should we? agree to something advantageous to them. But in his wisdom, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam could see more than they could see. That when those in Mecca who are attracted to Islam were to leave Mecca to go to Medina, and in Medina, we could not allow them to stay in Medina. Where will they go? Where will they go? My gosh, they'll go to a place the Quraysh didn't like at all. Oh no. And we would have no responsibility for that. And so we contracted the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. It is sometimes called the Sulh which is a peace treaty. But this is not sulf. This is not a peace treaty, no. This is hudna. Hudna is a truce, a truce. No fighting for a certain period of time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to the treaty of Hudaybiya with these tremendous words. At the beginning of Surah Al-Fatih, بَعْدَ عُوذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا we have, we have given you a manifest victory, O Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. Where is the victory? I'll tell you. We returned to Medina and as a good leader, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam does not speak, not even to his wives, sometimes that's difficult, eh? not even to his wives, he does not speak, true leadership. 
he allowed the men to rest for two weeks and at the end of two weeks he gives the order we march to Khaiba right away you don't have two four six days to prepare right away we marching to Khaiba so there was no time for spies to send a message there were no telephones in those days no cell phones in those days and we marching to Khaiba this is another initiative but not a peace offensive Khaiba is a thorn in our flesh Khaiba is reeking with hatred and venom against us Khaiba is a threat to us and he marched to Khaiba to eliminate that threat and he was so successful that he could leave Makkah sorry he could leave Medina undefended and march to Khaiba because the Quraysh had their hands tied they had a truce with us no fighting so Makkah, Medina is safe Medina is safe this is diplomacy at its finest when we arrived in Khaiba and the Jews came out in the morning they rubbed their eyes it's Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam they were taken by surprise this is military strategy at its finest Khaiba had no time to seek to make any alliances to seek to get help from anywhere within no time at all we had surrounded Khaiba and laid siege on Khaiba in fact when Allah said inna fatahna laka fathan mubina the implication was that on the day that the treaty of Hudaybiya was signed Khayba fell it was only a matter of time the treaty of Hudaybiya spelled the end of Khayba it was only a matter of time if only we could have that kind of strategic thinking today and then we eventually were able to conquer Khaiba we defeated Khaiba and on the day that Khaiba fell Makkah fell it's only a matter of time all of Arabia was watching now that Badr had taken place and Ohad had taken place and Khandak had taken place all of Arabia was watching in this military stalemate and then when they saw the initiative to Hudaybiyah and when they heard about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and that the treaty of Hudaybiyah allowed the Muslims to be recognized in all of Arabia on terms that were equal to the Quraysh because the treaty said any Arabian tribe who wants to align themselves with the Quraysh is free to do so and any which wants to align themselves with the Muslims is free to do so and so now we have a political stature a political status in Arabia equal to the Quraysh so they were impressed 
by what we did at Hudaybiyah. But when we returned to Medina and then attacked Bakka, uh, attacked, sorry, Khaybar, and defeated the Jews in Khaybar, that turned the tables in the thinking of all of Arabia. And the Arabian tribes now look towards Islam as a force to be respected and a force to be admired. And one by one, they started to enter into Islam. It was after Hudaybiyah and after Khaybar that the largest number of Arabs entered into Islam. Because of this change in the strategic environment which we had brought about because of our peace offensive against Mecca and then our brilliant move against Khaybar. There are two years now left after six to eight. Khaybar was in the year six of the Hijra. And in these two years, as more and more Arab tribes are entering into Islam, our side of the equation is growing. <laughs> and Makkah is feeling despondent that they have been outmaneuvered by the brilliance of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam who was not giving you an Islam go to the masjid and go back home go to the masjid and go back home and put your foot put your head in the sand like an ostrich and pretend that the world does not exist that is not Islam that's cosmetic Islam and if brother Imran is speaking like this today it's not because he has any animosity in his heart for these people it's not because he wants to embarrass them. They are his brothers. And he admires them for their faith and their piety. All that he wants to do is to give, up a wake, give them a wake-up call before it is too late to wake up. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam is giving to us this diplomatic brilliance. An understanding of the strategic environment and an initiative that succeeds in changing the strategic environment and making it more favorable for him and hence giving to us a sunnah that we must do the same you cannot do that with protestant Islam which says that the only thing we have in Islam the only interpretation and explanation is that which comes from Allah and His Messenger and from the Aslaf. And if it does not come from them, then no one else can come with it. There is nothing new to be taught. And so no critical thinking, no creative thinking, no creative application of the strategic sunnah in this critical moment in which we are now located on the brink of a very pit of fire. One of the tribes that was allied with the Quraysh attacked a tribe which was allied with the Muslims. And blood was shed and a few men were killed. And so the treaty has been violated. Once the treaty is violated then we are no longer in a state of truce with you. Because this is a law, a universal law. Pacta sunt servanda, they taught me when I was a student of international relations. Pacta sunt servanda, treaty obligations must be honored. Well, that's the first verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah, the very first verse. Honor your treaty obligations. When you give your word, you must keep your word. And so now the treaty is violated. We no longer 
are under any obligation to remain in the truth. And the Quraysh realizes that. But the Quraysh does not want a resumption of war. Do you see how the tables have turned? Just a few years ago, they were beating the drums of war. And they are marching to Badr. The rich people's army, the state of the art weaponry. 1,000 men singing songs of triumph. But now, they want the treaty to remain in force. They don't want the resumption of hostilities. So Abu Sufyan himself, the leader, <laughs> the leader, because Abu Jahal is gone, Utba is gone, so many others are gone. Abu Sufyan himself travels to Madinah to meet with Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. But when he arrives in Medina, he gets a surprise. Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam refused to speak with him. Sometimes silence can mean so much. So when you continuously send an email to me and you do not get a reply, you must know. Silence can be very profound, very profound. And then when he goes to the companions of the Prophet wasalam, they also give him the same treatment. They won't talk to him. So he put his tail between his legs and went back to Makkah, knowing that all is lost. <laughs> knowing that all is lost. It's only a matter of time. No sooner had Abu Sufyan returned to Makkah than we marched with 10,000 men. Because during these last two years, so many tribes have become Muslim. And when we arrive on the skirts of Makkah, we camp for the night. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, build as many fires as you can. So maybe if we had 10,000 men, you had about 20, 30,000 fires? Because the Quraysh are going to come to count the fires to decide how big is our army. And when they did do come to count the fires, when they saw how many fires there were, this is the psychology of warfare. Their hearts were gone. All is finished. There is no hope for us. No hope. During that night, Abu Sufyan came and took the Shahada, became a Muslim. Strategic Sunnah that you do not sit down and simply follow the dead and the sunnah clothing and the sunnah food and these things which are sunnah and important but you must also be aware of your environment your strategic environment and you must take initiatives to try to change the strategic environment to make it more favorable for you what is the strategic environment in which we are now located we have NATO the most powerful military machine in the world, the Zionist NATO, waging war on anyone who does not submit to NATO. That's what they're doing. And they're now about to move in for the kill. Wage massive war on the Arabs in particular. So that Israel can impose its political and economic dominion over the Arabs in particular and then over the rest of the world. That's the game plan. What do we do? What do we do? He told us what to do. 
Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam He told us what to do Hadith is there No one has criticized this hadith as being Da'if or fabricated He said that you will make an alliance with Rum Who is Rum? Rum is in the Quran Alhamdulillah that Rum is in the Quran And Rum in the Quran is a Christian world But the Christian world is of two sides there's Christianity of the West where you have the Roman Catholic Church in Rome in Rome and so on and the Protestant Church and you have Christianity of the East which was the Byzantine Empire this one celebrates Christmas on December 25th this one does not this one has Christmas on January 9th I believe he said you will make an alliance with Rome if you believe that Rome is NATO and Rome is the American, Anglo-American alliance please make an, an appointment with a psychiatrist you're crazy Rome is, con is the Byzantine Empire which had its headquarters in Constantinople and when we conquered Constantinople then the patriarch of this Eastern Christian Orthodox world he announced, he announced that the headquarters, now, headquarters are now shifted from Constantinople to Russia I didn't do it, he did it and so Rome today, they recognize Rome today as Russia and the alliance that is with Russia but Russia is also part of the Gog and Magog and so we have to recognize that we have a fairly complex situation here needing a lot of thought that there's one face of Russia which is Magog and there's another face of Russia which is Rome and it is with Rome that we are going to make our alliance that alliance is already coming into being it's not Saudi Arabia that is making the alliance with Rome it is not Protestant Islam that is making the alliance with Rome no the alliance with Rome has started with Iran Iran is making the alliance with Russia in fulfillment of this hadith and you say that the Shia are all kuffar go back and do your homework Pakistan is now moving into an alliance with Russia and when NATO launches her big wars there's going to be civil war in Turkey to get rid of NATO and the Turkish government won't be able to stop it and the Turkish Muslims are going to make an alliance with Rome and that's the conquest of Constantinople that is coming and so we end now having first explained to you the strategic sunnah we have now applied that strategic sunnah in a very preliminary way that in order to change our strategic environment we need to follow the hadith and make an alliance with Rome which will strengthen our hands against those who are waging war on Islam we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may guide us on the right path and bless our efforts with success Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim wa tub alayna ya mawlana innaka anta tawab rahim برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين
Alhamdulillahi wa kafa Wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhina astafa Khususan ala afdalihim Wa khatamin nabiyin Muhammadin al-amin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتاب تبيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم respected imam brothers and sisters here at Malaba Masjid Hidayatul Islam in Silayan I hope I got that correct In Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The Ummah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam the world of Islam and indeed the world at large is at this moment poised on the brink of a pit of fire the world is about to change as it has never changed before in history a more evil world is coming a world with great things and it is further necessary for Islamic scholarship to turn to the seerah and the sunnah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam so that we can apply it to this age for Allah says about the Prophet Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam Laqad kana lakum Fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana Ila akhiril ayah That he is the perfect model Universally applicable Eternally applicable Cosmetic Islam Cannot do that job no cosmetic islam is that one in which you go to the masjid and you go back home and you go to the masjid and you go back home and you go to the masjid and you go back home and the same bayan is being repeated over and over and over again for 60 70 years like clockwork Cosmetic Islam puts his head in the sand like an ostrich and does not attempt to either study or respond the world to the world in which we live and so that cannot succeed in doing the job that we must do and then there is that Protestant version of Islam in which there is no critical thinking no critical thought how to apply the truth in this age how to use the Quran to explain the reality of the world today no for Protestant Islam only Allah and his messenger and the Aslaf, the early Muslims, can explain and interpret. No Imran Hussein cannot do that. And we will not allow him to do that. But guess what? The world is listening to Imran Hussein. And we say thank Allah for that. Today we address the Sunnah. And we advise and we remind yes the bed is a sunnah and it is an important sunnah Allah did not put the bed on the face of the male by accident 
He put the beard on the face of the male with wisdom so that from a distance we can distinguish who is male and who is female without having to look at any other part of the body. That's wisdom. And of course, he put the blade, he put the beard on the face of the male so that babies can play with the beard. So if you shave your beard, you're being unjust to your babies. <laughs> they can't play with the beard anymore. The sunnah is the clothing that we wear that is designed to conform to a certain norm of modesty. But this is not the only sunnah. The sunnah is how we eat. But this is not the only sunnah. The sunnah also includes being aware of the world in which you live. Or to be more precise for today's lecture, to be aware of your strategic environment. And you are engaged in the struggle of truth against falsehood. And the forces of falsehood are always going to attack you. But in the end, truth must vanquish falsehood. And oppression is coming. A world with more intense war on Islam, more sophisticated war on Islam is coming. And all of this on Israel's behalf. So the Zionists can cause the state of Israel to replace the United States of America as a new ruling state in the world so that in the same way that Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica so too will a Pax Judaica replace Pax Americana why is this happening? Eleven years ago, I wrote the book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran, which explained that subject. If the scholars of Islam do not, at this critical moment in time, explain the reality of the world in which we now live. Explain the world that is coming and prepare not only Muslims but also mankind who is willing to listen to us. Prepare them how to respond. If we fail if Islamic scholarship fails, if the scholars of Islam fail, then do remember what Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said about akhirul zaman, the end time. Non-Muslims would be astonished to hear what he said. Hadith in the Sunan of Bayhaqi. He said, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, Yushiku ayati ala nasi zaman. It will not be long before that time will come. La yabqa min al Islami illa smu. When nothing will remain of Islam but the name. وَلَا يَبْقَى مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا رَسْمُ And when nothing will remain of the Qur'an but the traces of the writing مَسَاجِدُهُمْ 
amiratun wa hiya kharab min al-huda the masajid will be grand structures thousands of people in the masjid but they will be devoid of guidance and now listen to the last piece ulama'uhum the ulama of those people at that time Sharrun nasi mimman tahta adim is sama. They would be the worst people beneath the sky. Min indihim takhrujul fitna wa fihim ta'u. They would be the centers of fitna which tests and corrupts the people. And so, it is necessary for Islamic scholarship at this critical moment to address the reality that confronts us in the world today and to use the Qur'an to do that. Since Allah says in the Qur'an, in Surah An-Nahl, that He sent down this book to perform this function tibyanan likulli shay to explain all 